Your Dean will have instructions for sharing questions about the presentation in just a minute. Please keep your behavior both in the room and in the chat appropriate and on topic. Attendees engaging in inappropriate behavior of any kind will be removed without further notice. This program is being recorded and will be shared by next week via Knowles Facebook and YouTube platforms. The link for tonight's program is reusable to access all the other programs remaining in this series in March and April. If you misplace the link, you can sign up again. Additional programs coming up at Knowles include virtual trivia on February 25th and several book group meetings um, that meet monthly and virtually. You can see the books up for discussion and more program information at Knowles.org. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we live and gather is the colonized homelands of Indigenous peoples. We want to express our deepest respect to those peoples past and present for their care of this land throughout the generations. Take it away, Dean. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. Um, my name is Ranger Dean, and uh, my pronouns are he and him. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Perspectives um, series this evening. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us um, a PhD student from Purdue who's pursuing uh, some of her research here on the Olympic Peninsula and in Olympic National Park. Um, I would also like to recognize um, our friends group, the Friends of Olympic National Park, who helped, uh, in addition to the library, help to make the program possible. So we're grateful for their assistance. They are a membership organization. So if you want to um, join the friends group, you can look for them on Facebook and online um, and become a member of that group. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Her name is Erin Donaghy. Um, Erin received her undergraduate uh, degree from Bucknell and a master's from Northern Arizona University in um, geology. She worked in the oil and gas industry for a time before returning to school. She's currently a PhD student at Purdue University in Indiana. Um, and her research has taken her out to um, the North Olympic Peninsula and Olympic National Park. And um, just so folks know that uh, the national parks are great places for scientific research to be conducted. Uh, the Park Service has a permitting system and um, Aaron um, went through that process to obtain a permit um, to conduct her research on the national park. Um, and each year, Olympic National Park issues um, in the neighborhood of 100 to 130 or so of those uh, scientific permits. Um, so without um, anything further, I'd like to turn the time over to Aaron for questions. Um, we're gonna use the chat feature today. So go ahead and um, write your questions in the chat. Um, and then at the end of her presentation, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll answer those questions. Um, if I see a question that comes up in the chat that's not related to geology that I feel like I can answer uh, accurately, I'll go ahead and uh, attempt to answer that uh, as we go along. Um, but if it's geology related, I am not going to answer that. I'm going to let Aaron answer that at the end of the presentation. So um, thanks, Aaron, for being here um, all the way from Indiana today to join us and let us know a little bit about uh, the research that you're conducting here. And thank you so much for having me and thank you for the introduction. I'm, I will get started and I'm going to share my screen. So we should be able to pull up this presentation. Okay. And so again, Thank you everyone for your attention and attending this talk. I'm really excited today to talk a little bit about some of my research at Purdue. My name is Erin Donaghy and I work with both Mike Eddy and Ken Ridgway at Purdue University. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about just a little bit of my PhD thesis, um, which is focused on revisiting the Cenozoic stratigraphy of the sedimentary peripheral rock sequence on the Northern part of the Olympic Peninsula. So I'd first like to begin by uh, with an acknowledgement that this research was conducted on the 
of lands, the appropriated homelands of indigenous people. And we do these acknowledgements in order to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving our relationships between these nations, as well as to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. I'd also like to acknowledge the following people and organizations which helped make this research possible. Both the Evolving Earth Foundation and Earth Rates provided funding for this project. And then Nick Regeer and Sam Brockschmidt are both Purdue undergraduate students in the geology department, and they aided with field work in this past summer in the Olympic uh, Peninsula. I'd want to thank Olympic, Olympic National Park for their help in the permitting process and allowing us to be able to collect samples and conduct our research within the park limits. And then I'd like to extend a thanks to all of the logging companies that are listed here. All of them were great at communicating, providing access to their logging roads, as well as being able to map and collect samples on their land. And then I'd also like to thank Michael Polins and Alex Steely from the Washington DNR. They were immensely helpful in figuring out logistics for this past summer's field work. Okay, so this is a brief outline of what I'll cover in today's talk. I'll go through an introduction that highlights the project goals, as well as the regional stratigraphy and geology and tectonic setting of the Olympic Peninsula. We'll then go through an overview of the stratigraphy of this peripheral rock sequence on the Northern Olympic Peninsula, and then really focus in on some of the lowermost units of that um, stratigraphic section, which include the Blue Mountain unit and the Aldwell and Meyer formations. And we'll take a detailed look at some of the lithophases mapping, as well as the provenance data that was collected in these formations. And then I'll conclude with a discussion on how these results from this mapping and these data allow us to infer the depositional environments in which these rocks were deposited and how that relates to the overall regional tectonic setting. And so the goal of this project is to understand basin formation following the collision of an oceanic plateau to the Pacific Northwest 50 million years ago. So if we take a look at this simplified geologic map here on the left, these shaded purple areas represent oceanic plateaus. In Washington and Oregon, this plateau is known as Celestia, and it's accreted to the Pacific Northwest continental margin. And the plateau up in southeastern Alaska is known as the Yakutat terrain, and this is currently colliding with the continental margin. And on this map, you'll notice these black lines. These represent large right lateral strike slip faults, which extend all the way from northern Washington up into southeastern Alaska. And you can see they separate our pieces of oceanic plateau. And so there was a hypothesis by Wells and others from 2014 that based on the composition, the thickness, and the age of these oceanic plateaus, it's thought that this, these plateaus once formed as the same oceanic plateau offshore of the Pacific Northwest Cordilleran margin approximately 55 to 50 million years ago near the early Yellowstone hotspot track. And so this composite oceanic plateau accreted to the, the Cordilleran margin around 50 MA. And then following some point after collision, this Yakutat terrain broke off and it began its northward translation to where it's currently subducting beneath south, southeastern Alaska. And despite all the previous research that's been done on the Olympic Peninsula sedimentary strata, this, these rocks haven't been put in the context of this new model of oceanic plateau collision. And resolving this problem is really significant because it not only helps us unravel this colonial and transport story of these oceanic plateaus in the Pacific Cordillera, but more broadly, understanding the processes that is, are associated with oceanic plateau formation is really important for understanding our growth of continental margins. And so you might be wondering, what is an oceanic plateau? And simply put, oceanic plateaus are just over pieces of oceanic crust. So when we think about standard oceanic crust, that's about seven kilometers thick. Oceanic plateaus can be up to 30 kilometers thick of basalt. 
And on this slide, I have put a simple, the most popular model for how these form. And this is the plume model. And so in this model, you have this mantle plume that's derived from the mantle core boundary, and it rises up through the mantle before it hits the base of the crust at a divergent margin. So where you have two plates coming apart, where you have a spreading center. And when this plume head interacts with the base of this crust, it allows for this large volume of basaltic um, basalt to be extruded onto the seafloor very rapidly. And it creates this over thickened oceanic plateau. And if we want to think about where this is happening today or what a, a modern day analog would be, we can think about Iceland. So this on this um, shaded relief bathymetry map of Iceland, you can see that Iceland is located over a spreading ridge. So this is that northern extent of the mid-Atlantic spreading ridge, and it's located right next to a mantle plume, the Iceland hotspot. And you have this large oceanic plateau, which is Iceland itself, that is forming in this area. So this is what we can think about when we think about an oceanic plateau. And so the next question is, what happens when we slam one of these things into the continental margin? And that all re really depends on the rheology of the oceanic plateau. And we know that when the oceanic plateau that collided with the Pacific Northwest, it was still being constructed when it was um, when it collided at 50 ma so it was very hot and buoyant and because it was hot and buoyant it was weak and so when it collided to the continental margin as a result this plateau is captured and the oceanic lithosphere that it's riding along breaks off and so you get this big magmatic flare-up above this zone of break off and that would cause a flare up in what our early cascade magmatic arc was. And so what we're really going to be talking about today then is the basin that forms after you've accreted an oceanic plateau to the continental margin. You have this outboard migration of the subduction zone and rapid subsidence allows for these sediments to prograde out onto the oceanic plateau and form a basin. And so we're going to be talking about this coast post-collisional basin and the significance and what we can learn from it and what it tells us about oceanic plateau accretion processes in general. And so characterizing the lowermost part of this basin record really allows us to better understand basin formation following oceanic plateau collision. And if we think back to this model that we want to test, did Silesia and Yakutat form as the same oceanic plateau? Well, we would expect that the initial basin sediments that were deposited when Silesia and Yakutat were together would be that lowermost um, part of the stratigraphic section. So we really need to refine the stratigraphy that we have on the Olympic Peninsula before we can then go and correlate correlate that to age equivalent strata that are, is exposed on the Yakutat terrain in southeastern Alaska. And so I'm in the following slides going to walk through these three main stratigraphic problems that we've identified in our research that still exist on the Olympic Peninsula. But really all of these stem from that there's uncertainty in age and the stratigraphic correlations across different fault blocks that are exposed on the Olympic Peninsula. And that's due mainly to limited geochronologic data. So most previous regional correlations and ages for these units is based on biostratigraphy, which is really great, but it gives us a very broad range of the ages these rocks could be deposited in. And so we really want to tighten up up that geologic time scale for when these rocks were deposited. So if we look at this simplified map, the purple on here will be those oceanic plateau basalts. And the green unit here, this is the accretionary prism rock. So this is what makes up the Olympic core. And you'll see that the basin sediments that are of interest are these beige colors. So there are age equivalent strata in the south. We're not going to talk about those today, but it is one of the focuses of my work to try to correlate these age equivalent strata from north to south. And we're really just going to be focusing on this northern exposure of these basin sedimentary um, units. <clears throat> 
So if we zoom into that zone, this is a simplified geologic map of the Northern Olympic Peninsula. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the key features and structures that will be of interest for this talk, as well as the sedimentary units. So again, these green units here, which are making up the Olympic core, that's accretionary prism strata. And these are separated from the units that we're interested in from, by the hurricane ridge fault. And so the hurricane ridge fault separates these accretionary prism strata from the blue mountain unit and the lower and upper crescent um, formations. And so the crescent formation is mostly just massive basalts. If you've ever driven the road up to the visitor center in Olympic National Park, you've probably passed amazing road cuts of pillow basalts and massive basalts. The, that's the crescent formation. So the basalts we're talking about today. And then the other main units of interest is this peripheral rock sequence. And so this is exposed by these browns and this gray unit here and this lenticular shape. And one of the key questions we have about these units is that we have these major faults cutting across the Olympic Peninsula. We have the Hurricane Ridge Fault, but we also have this lower Elwha Fault. And you can see that it separates these age equivalent strata that are located over near Mount Zion from the rest of the peripheral rock sequence. So one of the questions that we're trying to answer with this research is how do these strata correlate each other to each other across these different fault blocks? One of the major questions we also have is this blue mountain unit. This is this um, pink unit here that's shown against the Hurricane Ridge Fault. You can see it's interbedded with some of the basalts that are mapped to be part of the crescent formation. And the main question about this unit is how does it correlate to this peripheral rock sequence? So all of the previous research um, on the peninsula before some of this geochronology work done by Mike Eddy was that this blue mountain unit represented this um, was interbedded with the lower crescent formation. So it would have been around 55 million years old and it formed in this rifted four arc margin setting. But new age data from some of Mike Eddy's work back in 2016 and 2017 showed that this unit is actually significantly younger than what previous researchers thought it to be. And when we look at this age, less than 45 million years old, this age is equivalent to some of these lowermost units, the Aldwell and the Lyer formation that we see in the peripheral rock sequence. So one of the big questions we want to answer is how does this correlate this Blue Mountain unit to the peripheral rock sequence? And also if it's interbedded with these lower crescent basalts, that would suggest that this volcanism, these mafic um, basalts that are interbedded are much younger than we previously thought, which would be a separate phase of younger volcanism that is separate from the volcanism that constructed the oceanic plateau between 50 and 55 MA. And so now we're just going to take a look at this peripheral rock sequence in the stratigraphic column. If you've never seen a stratigraphic column before, they're set up so that the oldest units are on the bottom and the youngest on the top. And that's because when we think about how sediments are deposited in a basin, they're deposited and they form horizontal layers. And so as you progressively bury more and more layers, the oldest stuff is going to be at the bottom and the youngest is going to be at the top. And so this whole peripheral rock sequence is interpreted to be deposited on deep marine distal to medial submarine fan deposits. However, when I was doing first getting familiar with the geology of the area, this liar formation really stood out because it's characterized by these coarse grain freches and conglomerates, which is really rare to see in a deep marine distal setting. So one of my other key questions would be, how does this liar formation fit into this stratigraphy and depositional environments? And what would drive such coarse grain deposits to be um, deposit it in a deep marine setting. And so on this stratigraphic column, you can see all the locations we've sampled to do detrital zircon geochronology as well as igneous geochronology. And this will help us understand where sediments were coming from. And the igneous geochronology of volcanic beds will allow us to get precise ages of these different units. 
And so this leads right into how can we use the sedimentary record to understand the tectonic history. And that first question or first task we really have to tackle is how old are the rocks? We want to improve our understanding of the regional stratigraphic correlations. And so we can do this by doing uranium lead chemical abrasion on our zircon grains that come out of these felsic volcanic inner beds. I won't be presenting any of this age data today because we are still in the process of collecting it. So I will mostly be presenting my interpretations for depositional environments and where sediments were coming from and my tectonic model for how I believe that these sediments were deposited at deposit it within and how it relates back to this whole story of oceanic plateau accretion. And hopefully in the near future, we'll have some ages to test some of these models I'm going to present today. So we're going to start out with the Blue Mountain unit, and we're going to start with this unit because we think it could possibly represent the initial basin sediments on top of the oceanic plateau. And this again is middle Eocene in age, it's less than 45 MA, and it's been interpreted to have been deposited by deep marine turbidites, but it's also interbedded with these volcanic and volcanoclastic rocks. So you can see these purple interbeds. And so what we really wanted to test with using um, field work this past summer was, are these sedimentary units of the Blue Mountain unit in fact interbedded with these big igneous basalt beds, or are they structurally juxtaposed? Because that would really signify two different stories. If it's an interbedded, then we have this younger phase of volcanism that hasn't been documented previously on the Olympic Peninsula. So that makes this unit extremely interesting in how we're going to think about understanding oceanic plateau formation and accretion. And so I'm going to explain some lithophases mapping, but first I wanted to give a brief introduction to what lithophases mapping is, if you've never heard of it, and how it differs from ge geologic mapping, or geologic maps you might see in the park brochure. And so this is one of the most important tools we have for reconstructing ancient depositional environments. And lithophases maps will show the distribution of different um, rock types in a single area. So if we're working in rocks of the same age, like we are in one single unit, the distribution of these rock types and sedimentary structures tell us the, um, tell us the position of the environments at that time in the past. So each depositional environment generally has an associated sequence of rock types or sedimentary structures. So if we can map these out over a large area, we can actually start putting together depositional environments and paleogeographic reconstructions of the area 50 million years ago. And so this is just one of the lithophases maps I'm working on now. You can see that it is not complete yet. I'm in the process of digitizing a lot of this data from the field. And this is at Blue Mountain. So if you drive Deer Park Road all the way to the top and you park at that parking lot and you take a walk around, you can see on the satellite photo, there's a little trail. You can actually go out and see a lot of these rocks for yourself. And these colors, these color blobs on this map represent where we were mapping different types of rocks. And you're going to see this throughout the presentation. And so usually these cool colors are where we were mapping sedimentary units, and the warm colors were where we were mapping igneous units like basalts. And so through time, we'll be able to, as I finish putting all the data on, be able to completely fill in this map and have a more complete product like you're going to see on the following slides. But I thought it would be nice to see how some of these things begin in the process of doing some of this mapping. So we're going to do an overview of the Blue Mountain unit. And I just want to give you a, a first glance at some of the major trends that we see in the lithophases. We mapped the Blue Mountain unit at a couple locations along Stripe with Tyler Peak and the Buckhorn Wilderness being the easternmost outcrop, and then Hurricane Hill and Hurricane Ridge being the westernmost outcrop. And so we did lithophases mapping at each one of these areas. And the major trend that we see at first glance is that 
as you move from east to west towards Hurricane Hill, you increase your volume of interbedded basalts. So we see far more interbedded igneous units over on Hurricane Hill than we do at Tyler Peak, which is dominated by mostly these transitional rocks we're going to talk about in the following slides. So we're going to zoom into the Tyler Peak area. And this is just the satellite photo to get you oriented. Here's Tyler Peak, Mount Baldy. You can access this area by driving up to the upper Dungeness Trailhead and taking trails straight up this valley to the ridgetop. And this just gives you an idea of the topography and the terrain we're working on. And you can see that you have these really big ridge formers that form the brown, the rocks that you can see. And then a lot of this stuff is covered or it's in forests and vegetated areas. And so this is the completed lithofaces map by Nick Regeer, one of the undergraduates that worked with me. And he presented this at the national conference back in October and as his undergraduate research project. So at a first glance, this map, the cool colors are gonna represent sedimentary units. The yellow and orange are gonna be transitional. So you can think of those as this mix between sedimentary and igneous rocks. And then all the warm colors are igneous. So that's gonna be things like pillow basalt, brecciated basalts, or just massive basalts. And I'll just add that some of these symbols on here, these little symbols are strike and dips. So they tell us the orientation of bedding. So it helps us trace out the contacts and recognize faults or folds in the area. And you can see all of our different lithofaces, which we're gonna walk through in the following slides so that you can see some pictures of what these rocks actually look like. And so we'll start with the sedimentary units. And this first lithofaces here represents these re recrystallized argillites and mudstones. And so they're really random pods, very isolated pods um, that are very poorly exposed. You can see a rock hammer here for scale. And these look very similar to um, these red carbonates that also exist in the Blue Mountain unit. But really to tell the difference between all of these different red units you're gonna see in the presentation, we would need more detailed analyses like thin sections or XRD to look at the composition of these rocks because they're so fine grained. The next facies is FA2, and it's these rhythmically interbedded mudstones and siltstones. So it's a rock hammer for scale here on a centimeter scale, tens of centimeter scale, interbedded sand, repeating sequences of sandstones and mudstones. You can see the sandstones here, the bedding's about vertical. They form these more resistant ridges where the mudstones are filling the cracks between these thin sandstone beds. The third lithofaces, um, we're starting to get a little coarser grain. So as we work up to these higher numbers, you'll see we're going from very fine grained units to coarse grained units. And so how we split these lithofaces up was not only looking at the bed thickness of the sandstones and the mudstones, but also the proportion of sand to mud that we saw in each of these areas, because that yields very important information on where we might think we are in a depositional environment. And so in the spaces, you have these more massive sands. This one's pretty fractured and beat up. Um, there's a little fold through here, so it's a little tough to see. And then as we move up to this FA4, you can tell that we're starting to get much thicker beds of sandstone on the scale of meters where, you know, in those initial lithofaces, we were on centimeter scale. So there's not as much mud in these, um, this coarser FA4. It's mostly sandstone dominated. And so now we're going to move on to the transitional facies, which are some of these orange and yellow units on the map here. And Nick Regeer did a really great job of classifying these volcanoclastic deposits and set up this scale that classified these rocks based on the modal percentage of the breccia class that we saw. So you can see kind of working from um, right to left on these slides that over here, that it's dominated mostly by this fine grain green matrix, and this is basaltic glass. So it's mostly just basaltic glass shards and basaltic tuff. 
that's kind of been sheared through here. And then as you work towards the left on these different facies, you start to see a larger fraction of these basalt clasts that have been incorporated into this green fine grain matrix. So now we're gonna talk about the igneous facies, so these big red units. And just at first glance from this map and kind of how I pointed out on the satellite image, these units really form the ridge formers in these areas. They're very resistant. So we see a lot of the igneous or the volcanoclastic units holding up the ridges, where these sedimentary units are filling a lot of the valleys or they're covered, they're not well exposed. Um, so it's another way that we can really use satellite imagery to help us map around some of these um, different units. So if we move to the igneous units, this first facies is, um, consists of massive basalt, sometimes diabase, and it can be vesicular in some places, and it outcrops in these really large knobs and ridges. So there's two people standing up there for scale to give you an idea. Um, and this is up on Tyler Peak. So if you ever hike up there, you can walk through this entire sequence. And then down along the road beneath Tyler Peak, we see these, this really beautiful exposure of pillow basalts. And so this is another one of the facies that we have here. And these pillows usually form when uh, lava is erupted in a uh, submarine environment. And so what we can tell from this map when we look at it, the key takeaway is that we really saw no evidence that these were structurally juxtaposed, these um, igneous units against the sedimentary. We saw these transitional volcanoclastic feces or some metasedimentary units where the igneous rocks were interfingering with the sedimentary units, which really suggests to us that this indeed is a depositional contact and we have these big lava flows that are in, interfingering with these deep water turbidites. So we're not gonna look too detailed in the Blue Mountain area. You saw that that lithophases map is incomplete, but the key takeaway I can tell you from my notes and what I have not digitized yet is that in this area, we see dominantly sedimentary rock. So when you drive all along Deer Park Road, you get this beautiful exposures of these turbidite sequence. So you can see it looks very similar to that second lithophases, these really thin inner beds of sandstones and mudstones that's very rhythmic. And so we go from this area that's dominated with these volcanoclastics and igneous units to an area that's dominated by sedimentary rocks. And there are igneous basalt flows through here. It's just at a much lower percentage. So for the sake of time, we're gonna jump over to um, Olympic National Park within Hurricane Ridge and near Mount Angeles. And so this is a zoom in of the area. We really were targeting where you can see where previous researchers have mapped these basalts interfingering with the sedimentary units. So we really wanted to pick transects that would expose us to a lot of the margins where people have mapped these units interfingering. So we'll jump to Hurricane Hill first. Again, just a satellite image to get you oriented. This is the road that will take you up to the visitor center. And then this is the trailhead for Hurricane Hill. So if you're interested in seeing these rocks for yourself, it's a very gentle hike to an easy hike to be able to get up to Hurricane Hill. And you can walk through a large sequence of what I'm gonna show you in the following slides. But again, we have these ridge formers, which you're gonna see are mostly composed of igneous units. And the sedimentary units are gonna be really forming these valleys and they're not well exposed. So this lithophases map doesn't have a nice digital elevation model or a bit behind it. So um, you don't have the topography that we saw in Nick Revere's map quite yet. But there are a couple different lithophases that we mapped here, mostly in the igneous units. But again, you can kind of see our transect lines here in red. We were really targeting um, the margins of this igneous unit where it was mapped to be interfingering with the sedimentary units. And so I've just grabbed a couple photos some, from these areas. This is the trail that takes you from the parking lot all the way up to Hurricane Hill where the little outlook area is right here. So if you walked along the ridge a little bit, you can access the sequence of interbedded volcanoclastic igneous and sedimentary units. 
And this is a photo taken from standing on this knob looking back towards the northwest. And you can see this contact of this sedimentary bed um, with the volcanoclastic and igneous units that are exposed there. So that's kind of what some of these contacts look like. And then for the igneous unit, we split this out as something different, this brecciated basalt. You really don't see that fine-grained green matrix here, so this looks like just the brecciated tops of basalt flows. And then some of these other igneous units that we see here that we didn't see at Tyler Peak, this little beige unit here represents these really fine-grained basaltic tufts or brecciated tufts that are photographed here. And then this unit here is kind of a mix of igneous and volcanoclastics. And you get these big, massive exposures. You can see it's holding up the ridge of Hurricane Hill. And these are pepperites and basalts. And then right beneath it, you can walk through some really broken up mudstones and sandstones. So this is the contact of igneous, volcanoclastic, and sedimentary units. And this pepperite is a really interesting rock because this is evidence that you had really hot basalts mixing with wet sediments. So it's really strong evidence that these things are interfingering and they're not structurally faulted against one another. So we're gonna jump over to the Mount Angeles area. And this is an interesting area because these darker purple units here are mapped as sedimentary units that were much older than the Blue Mountain unit, but we don't have any age data on it. So we wanted to take a look at this because our inclination was that maybe this is just Blue Mountain interfingering with this part of the crescent formation, like we see it in all these other areas along Stripe. So the satellite imagery to get you oriented, you can walk right up the switchback trail to look at this uh, sequence of rocks. And so here's that little knob that previous researchers have mapped as a separate unit. And when you get up to, this is Mount Angeles right here, and this is a photograph looking towards the direction of Mount Angeles right at the top of the switchback trail, you have this beautiful exposure of interbedded conglomerates, sandstone tufts, basalts, volcanoclastic units. It's like a mix of every single facies we mapped in the other areas. So this is really gonna be a target of um, future research later this summer and early in the fall to go back through here and try to collect some samples that we could get a really precise age on to understand if it's correlating to these blue mountain units that we've mapped along strike in the Hurricane Hill area. And this unit here, you can see this is a maroon calcareous volcanoclastic unit. It looks very sheared and it's in contact with these massive basalt flows. And you can see this right off the trail. It's pretty spectacular. And so to summarize the Blue Mountain unit, again, we see this um, increased volume of interbedded basalts. And we're pretty confident that, yes, these sedimentary units of the Blue Mountain unit are interfingering with these igneous units. And based on the proportion of where we see igneous versus sedimentary rocks, we can start to think about the depositional environment. And so for a depositional model of the Blue Mountain unit, we think that these were deposited on submarine volcanic aprons. So you have some sort of fissure eruptive center, which is allowing all of these basalts to flow down and it forms like a volcanic apron from this eruptive center. And it's interfingering and mixing with turbidites that are derived from the continental margin. And so based on where you are in this depositional setting would determine the amount of igneous units you have versus your sedimentary and volcanoclastic units. So we hope to be able to kind of reconstruct where we might think we are on different parts of this volcanic apron over that large area where we map the Blue Mountain unit. And so now we're going to move on to the peripheral rock sequence. Again, we're going to focus on the Aldwell and the Lyre formation, and because these are the lowermost units. And so we'll start with the Aldwell formation. I'm not going to show you detailed lithophases maps of the Aldwell and the Lyre. They are not as exciting as the Blue Mountain rocks, so I want to spend the most time on those. The Aldwell formation, I usually, when I explain it to someone, I just say it's a big pile of siltstone. But there is some variability. So the 
from the Eastern Aldwell formation to the Western Aldwell, we see not only a change in the composition of the rock, so the Eastern Aldwell uh, siltstones and sands are very enriched in basalt, versus in the West, they're enriched in chert. We also see um, this transition to more sand rich facies over near the CQ River. And so what that looks like is um, these are the really fine grain mud rich deposits of the Altwell. You can see these along Lake Crescent if you hike out towards the Devil's Punch Bowl, I think is what it is called. Um, you'll see all of these mudstones and siltstones along the trail. And you can actually see this fold up in the hill right before that tunnel um, in these really fine grain units of the Aldwell. When we move more towards the west, you can see that we start to get more sand mixed in there. So it's very thinly laminated, thin inner beds of fine grained sandstone with siltstones and muds. But you can see that overall it's more resistant. The, the sands allow it to be a little more um, resistant and form the little cliffs over in the western Siku River area. And so again, these are interpreted to be deep marine submarine fan deposits. And because of how fine grained they are, we would interpret them to be located on the distal portion of a submarine fan. If we move to the Lyer formation, this is that really interesting conglomerate of uh, facies that has been mapped out on the Olympic Peninsula. And overall, the main trends for the Lyer formation is that from east to west, you get this um, thickening of the lyre formation, and it also gets coarser grain. So where the lyre formation is around the um, Elwha River Valley and Lake Crescent is really dominated by pebble, gravelly conglomerates, where as we move towards the Siku River, we start to see pebble to cobble conglomerates. And then out on Cape Flattery, there's boulder breccias. And so this, are, these are just some photographs that kind of show some of those trends. I've not been able to get to Cape Flattery yet to look at those big boulder breccias, but hopefully that will be a place I can visit sometime in the future. But you can see that the lyre formation overall forms bridges. So a really great way if you're just driving along the north part of the Olympic Peninsula is that all of these other rocks of the peripheral rock sequence aren't well exposed because they're a lot of mud, a lot of fine grained sands. But if you see those kind of low lying knobs, that's probably the lyre formation. It forms these very resistant knobs. And you can see what some of those coarser grain conglomerates, there's a rock hammer here for scale. So these cobbled pebble conglomerate class, what they look like. And then as you move more towards the east, you get these really gravelly pebble conglomerates. So there's a huge change in the coarseness of these deposits. And so one way that we try to figure out where sediments were coming from is by doing a conglomerate class count. And in order to do a conglomerate class count, you just set up a grid in, a, in one conglomerate bed, and you would try to document about 100 to 150 class in that grid. And you want to move across the grid in a systematic fashion so that you avoid any bias and just picking all the large class or picking all the small class. So because sometimes all the large class might be one type of composition. So you could have a really biased conglomerate class count if you didn't um, sample every grain size in there. And then we plot the lithologies that we have on a histogram. And we can see how provenance changes a long strike in the lyre formation. So I've highlighted the lyre formation and I've kind of grayed out everything else. But the main trends that I want you to take away from this slide, because I know there's a lot on here, we don't have enough time to go through it all, is that we see this increase in metavolcanic and metamorphic class as we move from the east to the west. So you can see these blue, pie, um, blue parts of the pi diagram up here represent metamorphics. Um, so this key correlates to these pi di diagrams right here. And then for each one of these pi diagrams, I've split it into more specifics of, okay, they're metamorphics, but what kind of metamorphics? Because we can see variations in the class types as well for um, as we move along strikes. So in the westernmost area, the metamorphics are primarily these argillites and these coarse 
quartzites, and the igneous class are primarily basalts and diorite. And as we move more towards the east, we start to see increase in sedimentary class. And these sedimentary class, when we take a look at the pie diagrams, they're mostly chert and reworked sedimentary rocks. But we also have to remember that this area over here, this Mount Zion area where these conglomerates are exposed, are north of that lower Elwha fault. So this is one of those areas we want to test do these conglomerates that were mapped as a liar correlate to all of these conglomerates that are over here on the west. Just at first glance, we can see there's major change in the provenance for these conglomerates on the easternmost part. So they have a lot more reworked sedimentary clasts. You start to see some felsic plutonic clasts. And also we have the lyre formation being interbedded with a massive tuff here. So we've sampled this, hopefully we'll get an age and we can correlate it or maybe not correlate it over to some of these other um, lyre conglomerates. And so the depositional analog for the peripheral rock sequence, again, is that there are these deep marine submarine bands. And so when we look at the Olympic Peninsula and we try to figure out where these sediments were coming from, the closest thing is Vancouver Island. And on Vancouver Island, we have a lot of the facies that we see in the conglomerate class. So we have a lot of chert, we have a lot of basalt coming from everywhere at this point and reworking sedimentary rocks. So the main idea from a lot of previous inter and previous researchers is that sediments were coming from the north and they were coming down these deep submarine canyons and being deposited in these submarine bands. And so the lyre formation then, because it's so coarse grain, that means we have some sort of influx of these of coarse grain sediments and that they likely represent the submarine canyon or channel filled deposits um, in this scenario. Whereas the rest of the sequences, the um, Aldwell and the Hopo River formation, the Macaw would all be deposited somewhere out here on this fan system, depending on um, where it was proximal to distal. And we can tell that based on the proportion of sand to mud. And so those local changes in provenance that we saw along strike in the Lyre formation, as well as in the sandstones of the Aldwell and in other formations that we don't have time to talk about today, suggest that you could get changes in, very, um, changes in provenance if you had separate submarine canyons that were feeding different sources to different areas. So that's one explanation why we could see different um, types of conglomerate class or sandstone compositions along strike. They could be just sourcing sediments from different regions. So we're going to conclude by trying to tie this all back into this idea of oceanic plateau uh, collision. So on this map here, this is cross-sectional view. So this is a cross-section of this margin here. So this is map view. This would be your um, continental margin here. The purples, again, are our oceanic plateau. So we have Silesia and we have Yakutat. And we know that Silesia and Yakutat were probably centered over a spreading ridge. And so when Silesia and Yakutat accreted, it was this ridge-centered oceanic plateau. And so potentially the Blue Mountain unit, if it does represent these lowermost um, basin deposits, could represent this time of um, volcanism from this spreading ridge subduction or rifting of the Yakutat from the Silesia terrain. And this would allow for these continentally derived turbidites, the sedimentary rocks in the Blue Mountain, to interfinger with all of these fissure eruptive centers that are probably forming over this spreading ridge. And then as the Yakutat terrain starts to move away and we've accreted Silesia, you would get rapid subsidence. And when you're dropping out your basin floor really quickly, you have really fine grain deposition, all these sediments settling out. And so that would be your Aldwell formation. And they were deposited on the distal part of a deep marine fan, probably deriving sediments from the north. So there's Vancouver Island. And so you'd be in that very distal part of the fan. And then we have the mystery of this liar formation. And so the spreading ridge, as it's subducted, it's offset by these transform 
um, segments. So when you subduct one of those transform segments, the spreading ridge jumps. And as it jumps to the south, it eventually has to come back to the north. And that's because the spreading ridge is currently located to the north of us now. So we think that one hypothesis that could be that how you get all of this coarse grain sediment into this deep marine environment at once is that as this ridge passes back towards the north, it could have popped up that area to so cause rapid uplift and exhumation and dumped all of this coarse grain sediment onto our deep marine fan. And then following the passage of the spreading ridge, you essentially the rest of our formations that we don't have time to talk about would be um, the Hoko River formation, the Macaw, the Pish, those were all deposited in a deep marine um, setting on turbidites that after this ridge passed, you had subsidence again, and you kind of reestablished this normal deep marine submarine fan system. And so in conclusion, what um, these results really tell us about these lowermost units is that the Blue Mountain unit could represent this basal unit of the peripheral rock sequence. Hopefully in a couple months we will have some age data that we can start to test these hypotheses where the Blue Mountain unit fits in with that Aldwell or that Lyre formation or the Hoko River formation. And that the mapping that we did this past summer confirms that the Blue Mountain unit is interbedded with those volcanic beds. And so that means that there must be some sort of undocumented phase of younger volcanism, which we are thinking could possibly be related to rifting following the plateau collision. And then the influx of coarse grain sediments that we see in the lyre must be tectonically driven. And that's potentially driven by the passage of the spreading ridge. And then again, you get this rapid subsidence and then deep marine deposition of the rest of your sequence of the peripheral rocks. And so that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you for your attention and attending this talk. I would be more than happy to answer any questions now. Thank you so much, Erin. That was fascinating. Um, it is amazing to me to uh, see from the rocks, you can figure out the environment in which uh, those things were deposited. But I kept on thinking to myself like, okay, I'm thinking about the removal of the dams on the Elwha and the movement of all of that sediment um, and sort of what did we see in the reservoirs as the water receded and where do we see the coarser materials and the finer materials and kind of trying to figure that out. So um, for me, that was, that was fascinating. Um, and we do have some questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and read them off. And I encourage everyone else to continue to put those questions into the chat. So uh, Marjorie um, first says, impressive research. And she wants to know, how did you get interested in this topic? Um, what do you hope to do in the future? And what has been the most surprising finding? Those are all great questions. And so I have been interested in Pacific Northwest and Alaska tectonics since I started geology. Um, as an undergraduate at Bucknell, I worked in Southern Alaska and I worked on a Paleogene sediments up in Alaska and mainly a basin analysis project like this. So it, there's just a lot of unanswered questions about the tectonics during the Eocene, um, what's happening with plate reconfigurations and what plates were moving where. And so it's just been a question that I've always wanted to answer since I got started in geology. And my master's project followed that route. I worked in the Chumstick Basin near Leavenworth and Wenatchee in central Washington. So all in the same Eocene age time. Um, and I had a really great opportunity to work with Mike and Ken and kind of stitch that previous research I've done in Alaska and Washington together to try to look at both Alaska and Washington tectonics. And hopefully we can resolve some of the debates that have been ongoing in the tectonics field um, for decades. So um, yeah, and I think as far as what was the most surprising thing that I found out here, it definitely has to be that volcanoclastic sequence. I have 
Um, never seen rocks like that before. When I got up to Hurricane Hill and my advisor was like, oh, you're mapping sedimentary units and I'm a sedimentologist uh, by trade. And I got up there and it's a bunch of igneous rocks. And I was like, oh, what am I doing out here? Um, they're spectacular. So I really encourage you to try to walk through or take hikes up to Mount Angeles or a hike along Hurricane Hill. If they're very easily accessible. The Tyler Peak stuff is hard hike that was that was uh one of the toughest hikes i've ever done but it's just a spectacular exposure of these volcanic sequences and it was really amazing to see um and put this put together that story of these interbedded basalts and turbidites and kind of think about what environment that would form in um Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Marjorie, for those questions. Uh, Dora would like um, to ask that when you get the ages, will you share them? Yes, um, we are close. We are so close to running analyses in our lab. We should um, be able to start in a couple months. And so as soon as I get that age data, I am hoping to um, publish a paper pretty quickly so that can get out there <laughs> into the world. and. Um, present at conferences or do public talks. I am very excited to get that data, share that data, um, and test some of these models that I shared with you today. Awesome. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Eric. He, he said that he thought, um, they said, I thought I heard you mention metamorphic rock units involved in this story. Does this complicate any of the hypothesis? So there are metamorphic clasts in some of the conglomerates, which I might have uh, mentioned. And so those can be derived from any of the exhumed metamorphic rocks that are on Vancouver Island or along the continental margin. We're still working on where exactly those units could have, or those class could have come from. Because it's a conglomerate, they could not have been transported far. Um, so it's likely they have a more proximal uh, source. There are some metasedimentary rocks in the Olympic core. And so that's where we see a lot of like metamorphism because that's an accretionary prism. It's, it's undergone a lot of deformation in the last 50 million years. All right. Um, so um, JD asks uh, a brief contrast between the Olympics and Oregon coast range. Um, and then he says, uh, Yakutat versus Celestia, question mark. Oh, what was the question? The Contrast between the Olympics in the Oregon oh. range. And then he also has a, a, a second question, which is Yakutat versus Celestia. So I haven't worked in the Oregon Coast Range, but a lot of um, some of the rocks exposed down in Oregon um, are Cretaceous um, and represent a different tectonic phase. But as far as I can speak to Celestia and the Yakutat terrain, and we are planning to go up to Wrangell St. Elias National Park this summer and uh, work on the Cenozoic section that's exposed there, mostly in the Samover Hills and Robinson Mountains. And so we know there's a thick section of Cenozoic rocks. Uh, we, I have not get, gotten up there to see them. My advisor, Ken Ridgeway, has, so we know they're there. And so we'll do a very similar study based on analysis, lithotheses, measuring sections, collecting samples, to then be able to compare that lowermost stratigraphy. Because if Yakutat and Celestia were sitting right next to each other, and you had those initial basin sediments coming down onto them, then that lowermost sequence should be, we would expect to see similar provenance, so where sediments were coming from, and similar depositional environments. And then once the Yakutat terrain breaks off and goes north, then that's when things change on the Yakutat terrain, but largely stays the same on the Celestia terrain. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in our um, chat here. So um, thank you, Aaron, so much for um, the presentation and for the effort that went into
um, sharing your research so far. Um, it's fascinating to me. And um, I'm so appreciative of your time to come here and uh, to share with everyone. Uh, for everyone else that's uh, still with us, um, thank you for attending this evening and for spending your time with us. Uh, I just want to encourage you to continue uh, to come to our presentations. We have several that are um, upcoming. And so um, in March, we're gonna hear uh, from um, Janice Bauman from uh, Western Washington University and the work that she's doing with um, lupin and mycorrhizal fung fungi and um, their relationship to the uh, revegetation uh, of the Elwha reservoirs. And then in April, uh, we'll be hearing from um, Josh Chenoweth, who was the restoration ecologist uh, for Elwha River restoration um, and the revegetation of the reservoirs. Uh, he's moved down to Klamath um, to do similar work with the Klamath Dam removal. And so we'll be hearing from him in April. So thanks everyone for coming this evening. And thank you so much, Aaron, uh, for your presentation. Um, lots of comments going in there, thanking you for the presentation and 